So I want to welcome you to week seven of a series where we have been dealing with and talking about the Holy Spirit, the importance of the power of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. I want to share a message with you today that I'm, t- that I'm calling, Where is the Glory? Can, can I hear someone say, Where is the Glory? So many people are searching for the glory. I'm I'm telling you, even Christians, those who go to church every single week, there are pastors who are still searching for the glory. Uh, One of the one of the big questions that that have has come to me uh, as as long as I've been a pastor is what is my calling? What is my purpose? What does God want me to do? And I'm telling you, this, the most simple answer that I can give you is that you were created to worship the Creator. Can you say amen? amen. You were created to bring honor and praise to the God of creation. And if you're not doing that, you're far from where your calling should be. You're far from where you're supposed to be. And at this church, at Joy Church, as long as I'm the pastor, I am going to allow the Holy Spirit to have his will and his way in this place. Outside of the Holy Spirit, there's no power. You see, the blood of Jesus Christ is what cleanses. It does have power to wash away every single sin. The sins of this world. One sacrifice, forgiveness for all. But Jesus didn't stop at, at the resurrection. It didn't stop at the, at the cross. It didn't stop at the burial. The gospel didn't stop at the, the resurrection of Christ. But Jesus told his disciples, he said, I want you to go back to Jerusalem. And when you do, you're going to receive power. You're going to receive what? Power. power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And so we need to realize that the Holy Spirit, He is the mark, He is the seal, the evidence, and the proof that we have been washed in the blood. I've seen so many people walk through their Christian life. They they, they consider themselves, they call themselves a Christian, but they're walking in discouragement. They're walking in frustration. They have not yet received that power of the Holy Spirit yet. They're still walking in the flesh. Because when you're walking in the flesh, what, what's, what can you uh, know what the outcome is going to be? It's, it's death. The wages of sin is death. But when the, when the Spirit of God is operating in your life, you know without a shadow of a doubt, not only are you forgiven, but you have eternal life through Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? amen. So as long as, as I'm the pastor here, I'm going to be, be talking about the, the one name, probably the one forgotten name in the church in, in this day and age, in this season of the church, and that is the Holy Spirit. Probably one of the, the least talked about people is the Holy Spirit. But did you realize that the church was not born yet? The birth of the church happened on the day of Pentecost. It was 10 days after Jesus ascended into heaven. 10 days and then 40 days previously was the death, burial, and resurrection. Jesus resurrected, praise God, (laughs) proving that he was who he said he was. And then he, he, he walked among his followers, those who believed him, his disciples. He was talking to them about the kingdom of God. He was sharing to them with what was going to happen. And so he, he ascended into heaven and 10 days after he ascended into heaven, which would have been the 50th day, the day of Pentecost, Penta meaning 50, 50th day, the Holy Spirit descended on those who believed in Jesus. There were about 120 in the upper room. They were praying together. They weren't going into their separate prayer closets. They weren't separating themselves or dividing themselves. Hey, I don't like sister so-and-so. I don't like brother, uh, whatever his face is, because, man, he just, man, every time, he just just bugs me. No, there was no separation. They were such, they were in such anticipation and expectation of the words of Christ that they knew that something was going to happen. They didn't know exactly what it was going to be or how it would turn out, how it would play out, or when it was going to be, but they just, they they were made a promise by Jesus that they were going to receive power. 
And in Acts, the second chapter, we see the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes down upon those people and the church of Christ was born. And so we cannot be people who exclude the Holy Spirit, but we've got to make sure that we are being led by the word of God. You can't be led by the word of God if you're not picking it up and reading it. Amen. If we're not hearing the preached word of God, and if we're not listening to the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of you. So where is the glory? I want us to go to 1 Corinthians, the third chapter. First Corinthians three in that 16th verse, where is the glory? Before I read, let's maybe let's talk about what, what is the glory? What is the glory? So many people talk about the glory. What is the glory, God? Simply put, the glory of God is the presence of God. It's the favor of God. God, I, I need your favor. All I need is your favor. It's, it's, the, it's the comfort of God. It's, it's the power of God. It's the spirit of God. It's the Holy Spirit in operation. It's the glory of God. And so in, in the third chapter, 1 Corinthians 3, in the 16th verse, Paul, he writes these words. He says, do you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the spirit of God lives where? The spirit of God lives where? Can we do it like we did, say it like we didn't die two weeks ago? In you. In you. Where, so let's, let's, let me try it again. I'll give you another shot. God isn't all about second chances, right? So don't you realize that all of you together, someone say together, yes. are the temple of God and that the spirit of God lives where? In you. That was a little better, but I'm gonna let, I'll let you slide. The spirit of God lives in you. God's purpose and his plan from before the beginning of time wasn't to live and to dwell and to abide within temples made with human hands, made with physical material like, like precious metals and, and wood and, uh, I don't know, copper and, and gold. That was never his, his intention. That was never his purpose. But from the very beginning, his plan and his purpose was to live within inside his creation. And so Jesus, he told his disciples, it's better that I leave you. And his disciples, I can just imagine they were shaking. If I was there, I'd be like, no, no. You leave Jesus, we're done. Because we've seen you work, we, we, we've seen you move. We know you're the Messiah. We know you're the Son of God sent by God the Father. And if you leave, there's no hope. But Jesus knew better. He said, it's better that I leave you because if I don't, and then the other comforter, another comforter won't, won't come and to be in you. He said, the, the, there's another comforter who is coming, who, who dwells among you right now. But the plan is that he will come and he will live within you. Not just among you, but he will live where? In you. in you. And so when you become a Jesus follower, you gotta realize that you're not on your own anymore. You're not calling the shots anymore. It's not by your own strength, your own might, your own understanding, your own experience. It's not because that's what, what uh, daddy did or mama or grandma or grandpa did. We're not following a tradition. We're not following a ritual, but we're following the word of God. And as we follow the instructions of the word of God, led by the spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit, that's when we see things transform. Things move. Addictions crumble. We're talking about there's no body. There's no broken body that, that Jesus cannot raise. The most broken, the most dead. You can't even get more deader than dead, right? You're either dead or you're, you're not. We saw that Jesus, he died on an, on an old rugged cross. He was buried three days later. 
the power of the Holy Spirit filled up his body and rose that dead body back to life. And that same spirit, the same power, the same glory, the same presence that resurrected Jesus' body back from the grave is the same spirit that lives on the inside of every single believer. Can you say amen? Yeah, give the Lord a praise. And I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit doesn't have some like weaker twin brother that God is like, well, I'm going to give him the weaker one because, you know, that would make, uh, you know, if you gave him the same spirit that Jesus got. No, it's the same spirit, the spirit of God, the third person in the Trinity to realize that God is not one God manifest in three different personalities. But he's God manifest in three separate persons. One God, three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And them working together are one. Let me just take a little sidebar. In Genesis, we'll come back to this. Going back to the very beginning, just so that you know who the Holy Spirit is and that who who our God is. To realize that even from the very beginning, God wasn't, God's not schizophrenic. He's not talking to himself in in different persons. He, he, so notice here in, in Genesis, the first chapter, the 26th verse, then God said, who said? God God said, let us, someone say, "Let let us. What? But God said it. Why is he saying us? Because God isn't one God manifest in three personalities or three different personalities. He is one God made up of three persons with three distinct roles. Three distinct persons, three distinct roles, one God. Let us make man or human human beings in our image. In whose image? Our image. To be like who? To be like us. So we see here, we see God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit being displayed in chapter 1 of the book that he gave to us. He's showing us who he is. And we see God the Father all throughout the Old Testament. We see Jesus Christ the Son being represented and manifesting the the will of the Father in, in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And now we have the Holy Spirit in the church. In any church, like you've heard me say over the past few weeks, as we're on week seven right now, any church operating outside of the Holy Spirit is only an empty shell. It's only an empty carcass. There's no life. Have you ever been to a church where it's just, just cold? There was no life there. But I'm telling you, at this church, The Holy Spirit is invited every time we meet together, every time we gather. Because the transformation comes as we allow the Holy Spirit into the room. God, speak to our hearts. And that's why a preacher is able to preach a message saying one word, saying one thing, but multiple... A message to you, the Holy Spirit, in using those words to preach a message that's relevant to you in your life at that very moment. That's how you can read the same scripture when you're a teenager and wonder, what does that even mean? And then you're in college and you read that same scripture and it grips you in a way, you know, you're, you know you've got your... Your, your finals coming up and you're it's coming down to the wire and you're going to have to show your parents your grades and you're, you're getting to, and you read that same scripture and it just grips you in a different way. And then you have children in your life. In, or let's, let's start before that. When you get married, you read that same scripture. It will tug on your heart a different way and steer you in a, in, in a, in a different direction. Maybe that's relevant to your life. Are, are you following me this morning? Yeah. That's what the Holy Spirit does. When I was in, in high school for my, our senior trip, we were supposed to go, oh, I forgot where the trip was. It was some dumb trip to uh, some cruise, some boat thing. And I kind of wanted to go, but I really didn't want to go. 
I knew that some of my friends were going to be doing some things that they weren't supposed to be doing. They're going to be drinking alcohol, smoking some weed. And, um, and I knew I was going to get caught up in that stuff. And so for that senior trip, I opted out. And I had several cheap teachers come up to me. It was senior year. You know, they knew me. Brandon, why aren't you going to go on the senior trip? You're going you're gonna to regret it. And I just looked at him and said, no, I can't do it. I'm, I, I'm not going to go. I didn't tell him why. Do you remember the teacher, the Christian teacher, the man? I think he had a mustache. He was Christian? He was, oh, you don't remember? He, he also, uh, he was a counselor too. Um, but he knew my mom because my mom was a substitute teacher. And so this, no, it was, it was another one. Um, the senior trip comes, it goes, and come to find out the crew <laughs> that I was going to be hanging out with, that I would have been hanging out with, you know, the, the athlete guys, the baseball and football players, and uh, they got caught drinking, out, getting drunk, drinking alcohol, smoking weed. And a couple days later, I was sitting, I think I was sitting in the library. I, was, I passed this teacher up, this one of the counselors up, and he stopped me. He touched me on the shoulder and stopped me. And he said, Brandon, I want to commend you for not going on that senior trip. I had no idea. And he thought that that was, that was a stand-up thing, that I would skip something so important because I didn't want to get wrapped up in, in a certain thing that I didn't know if it was going to happen or it, I just knew it was a possibility. And I'm letting you know that that's what the Holy Spirit will do. Yes. You don't know the outcome. You don't know who's being touched or being impacted or being influenced. But if you will follow the Holy Spirit, and I'm telling you, let me say it again. The Holy Spirit is not schizophrenic. He's not going to speak something different or something aside apart from what the word of God has already spoken. Can you say amen? amen. So if, so, if someone, try, let me just warn you. If someone comes into the church or someone comes into your life claiming to be a prophet, and I'm not downing prophecy. The word of God tells us that prophecy is, is a thing. Prophecy is speaking the word of God with truth and conviction. But if someone is, is trying to prophesy over your life and it doesn't line up with scripture, it doesn't line up with the word of God, you can throw it away, as, throw it as far as you can. Don't worry about offending that person either. <laughs> it might be better that you offend them so they stop so get off your back, get off your tail. Amen. Amen. But the Holy Spirit is here and alive and well in the church. And that's how I know that regardless of what happens in this world, regardless of what happens on this planet, in this nation, in this country, in our families, that the church is not going to just survive. It's not going to be just alive, but it's going to continue to flourish. It's going to continue to grow to the glory of God and for the good of his creation. Can you say amen? amen? Because Jesus said upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So the world is going to face, you know, and we had a test of, uh, starting in 2020. Uh, do we really believe that God is a healer? Do we really believe that God, that, Je that God is Jehovah Jireh? That is he our provider? And a lot of people failed the test. A lot of churches, a lot of pastors failed the test. And they, they fell into the trap of, of what the, 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 the people in upper government we're saying and what they were telling us to do. And I, if I'm being honest, man, it was kind of sketchy. Like, like, man, do I? Do I not? Do we close the doors of the church? Is that a thing? Isn't the church a place where people come to be healed? Isn't this a place where we talk about having faith in Jesus Christ? That it, we believe something as crazy as trumpet sounding and Jesus Christ opening up the, the, the clouds of glory and bringing his church home? That's crazy. But it's true. And if we believe that, we can believe and have faith that Jesus Christ is building this church. And if he's building this church, the gates of hell won't prevail against it. That he will protect his people. And using wisdom is not going against the word of God. Amen. Amen. 
But it's follow. What, what does the word of God tell us about wisdom? The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. To fear the Lord. Have a reverent respect. God, I know that you're the only one who is able to cast my, my soul, my eternal soul, either into eternal heaven or eternal hell. Forever with God or forever burning in hell in flames that cannot be quenched. And the thing about it, when you think about that, God isn't sending people to hell. God didn't create hell for you and me. He created it for Satan and his followers. And to realize that Satan, he, the reason why he's so upset is because God gave us the job that he had in heaven. He was the worship leader in heaven. He got booted out of heaven, so now he's an unemployed angel, looks at the church and said, knowing that our... The reason why God created us is to worship and to honor him. Guys, you took my job. And so Satan is doing everything he can, roaming around, seeking whom he may devour for those who aren't paying attention. And so that's why, again, it's so important. That's why I'm spending so much time uh, talking about the, the importance of the power of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. Sooner or later, we're going to get it, right? Sooner or later, it's going to click. Oh, yeah, I do need the Holy Spirit. Without, then you're going you're to notice once you lean into the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit fills you up, and we actually have testimonies in, the, in this room of people who were, who were cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, cleansed by Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ, and they were living their lives on their way to heaven, but, but walk, not walking in power. I remember receiving a phone call, both Felicia and myself. It was a video phone call. And how this person felt like they were a fraud because they were, they were, they were saved. They were, they were cleansed by the blood of the lamb. But now the Holy Spirit, there was a moment that happened that the Holy Spirit came upon this person and they called, called Felicia and myself up and said, man, I want you to know what's, what's going on. And I said, hey, that's normal. That's a good thing. That's the Holy Spirit giving you revelation, giving you a new revelation of who Jesus Christ is and who you are in him. Now walk in power. And guess what? They are. Not night and day. The contrast is, is so different. Night and day. Walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. Can you say amen? amen. So talking about the Holy Spirit, I want to kind of just step into that, just to, just to lean into it just a little bit deeper. We see also the Holy Spirit, actually the, the Trinity, the God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, uh, revealing himself in, in John. I didn't plan on going in this direction, but I'm just going with it. I want to show you in, in the book of John, I believe it's chapter two. Actually, it's the first first chapter uh, chapter 1 verse 29 the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said look the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world he's the one who, who I was talking about when I said a man is coming after me who is far greater than I am for he existed long before me and if you go a few verses back if you go to the beginning of John John 1 you see where it says that in the beginning was the word someone say the word talking about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Jehovah's Witness Bible totally perverts it, totally twists it, and says he was a God. And that's how my, my dad would always, if he wanted to see how legit a Bible was, if it was the right translation, he would always go to John 1. And if you can get John 1 right about Jesus, you're there. And so in the beginning was the word. And so this is what John the Baptist was talking about. He said, he's the one who I was talking about when I said, a man is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he has existed long before me. And to realize that John the Baptist had a huge following. And for him to tell his followers and his disciples that there was someone coming after him that's greater, it's like, no, John, not greater than you. 
But John the Baptist, he was chosen by God to be uh, the, the last prophet of the Old Testament and the first of the New. He was the transition between the Old Testament and the New Testament or the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. He was the voice crying out in the wilderness, make way, make room, the Messiah is coming. He said, I did not recognize him as the Messiah, but I've been baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to Israel. 32, then John testified, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting upon him. So realize that the Holy Spirit is not a dove. He's not your conscience. He's not a mist. He's not a gut feeling. He is the third person in the Trinity. These are things that he does, but he is the Holy Spirit, the third person. He is God, the third person in the Trinity. So John, he testified, I saw the Holy Spirit descending or manifest himself like a dove from heaven and resting upon Jesus when he was baptizing him. I didn't know he was the one, but when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me, God told John the Baptist who the Messiah would be. He said, notice this, the one on whom you see the Spirit descend and rest or stay, abide in, dwell within, is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so we see God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, not God manifest in three different personalities, but God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, one God, three distinct persons, three distinct roles on full display right here in John, the first chapter. And notice what he says in 34. He says, I saw this happen to Jesus. So I testify that he is the chosen one of God. Can you say, thank you, Jesus. I want, I just wanted you to get a picture of the Holy Spirit and the picture of the Godhead. All of them working together as one. Never divided. Never separate. Let us make man in our image. That th they'll be like us. There's never been a disagreement. There's never been discord in, in, the, in the Godhead. But it's always been unity. So how do you know you're operating in the spirit of God? How do you know a church is operating where the, in the spirit of the Lord? Where is the glory, right? If the Holy Spirit is operating, you know that there, there won't be divisions. There won't be factions. There won't be separation. There won't be a certain group uh, place for, for the, the people who give more tithe and offering to sit. It's not a thing of where if you, if you pay more tithe, if you, if you invest more into, into the church, that you get more of a say. No, I don't even get more of a say. It's the Holy Spirit. And if I'm not being led by the Holy Spirit, I'm going to be leading you astray. I'm going to be leading you in the wrong direction. First of all, I'll be going in the wrong direction. I'll be leading my family in the wrong direction, and that'd be kind of, it'd be obvious to you. But then also, I'd be leading you astray, away from the purpose, the plan, the will that God has for you and for his church and especially for his kingdom. Can you say amen? I want to finish up. I just had one more line on 1 Corinthians 3. So let me just read it, just hash over it again. Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and the spirit of God lives in you? God will destroy anyone this is what I didn't read yet. God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple, for God's temple is what? Holy. Is holy, and you are that temple. Let me say it again. God, his, his purpose and his will, his intention was never to live and to dwell within uh, a structure or thing or a temple made with human hands. But his, his purpose and his plan has always been to live on the inside of his creation. And as we read in, was it Leviticus? I forget what chapter it was. That was earlier in the series. 
We saw where the, the blood was applied that brought cleansing, that brought a cleansing power. But the oil was applied over the blood, not on the flesh. And the oil represented the Holy Spirit, the presence or the glory of God. And we, we, we had a revelation on, on that Sunday that the Holy Spirit will not dwell within that which has not yet been uh, applied with the blood. The blood has to be applied first. There's a cleansing power, and then the Holy Spirit power then comes to live on the inside of you. Can you say amen? amen. Trying to make this clear so we don't leave this place. Uh, we don't leave the same way we came in. Like, I don't want you to go back to work with the same frustrations, with the same insecurities. I don't want you to walk back into your home with your shoulders shrugged, like being built up in the church with the Holy Spirit and then leaving and going home and being defeated all day, all throughout the week. But to realize that if you've got the Holy Spirit living inside of you, not only is he your comforter, not only is he your peace, not only is he the one who is instructing, leading, guiding, and directing, but he also equips you with power, power over sin power over depression, power over the things that the world is, is, is trying to figure out, trying to medicate. And we saw this happen when Jesus was, when you read through the gospels, how Jesus was just walking through and everywhere he went, he was healing people, people with medical conditions, people without eyeballs. He, he stuck mud in their eyeball sockets, told them to go wash in the river. After they washed in the river, they could see again. They didn't have eyeballs. How could they see? Because the creator gave them some new eyeballs. And so to realize that what Jesus was doing, he was showing the will of the Father and the power that he had when you're, when you're following the will and you're aligning your will with God's will, with his purpose. And so in, in 1 Samuel, is this good this, this morning? Are you learning anything? Only one person. In First Samuel, the, the fifth chapter. This this series is totally wrecking me. It's giving me it, in a good way, wrecking me in a good way, uh, giving me boldness. Because I'm allowing the Holy Spirit to to uh, operate and function in my life. And um, I'm seeing I'm seeing the same thing in you as as you're seeing it in me. It's also happening in you. Because God is not, he doesn't, he doesn't play, fav, he doesn't play favorites, um, but he, he is equal with every single person with his gifts. As you lean into him, his gifts are made free. They're free and available to all who are seeking him. And so in that, the, the first Samuel, the fifth chapter, starts out by saying, after the Philistines captured the ark of God, they took it from the, the battleground at Ebenezer to the town of Ashdod. So the Ark of God, or the Ark of the Covenant, was created by Moses with, through the instruction of God. God gave him the instruction on, on what to build, how to build it, what materials to use, dimensions and everything, and what to put in it. So he put the, the, the Ten Commandments, or the, the two tablet stones that, that were God's law within this uh, Ark of the Covenant, or Ark of God. And this ark of God, it was in the old covenant. And so Jesus had not yet uh, given his life. He had not, sat, he has not, he had not yet become the, 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 the lamb that was slain for, for creation. And so they were still under the old covenant, under the law. And what this ark of the covenant represented was the glory of God or the presence of God the spirit of God. And e even if someone touched it in, in, when they weren't supposed to, they would die. It's recorded here in, in Jewish history where people touched the Ark of the Covenant and actually lost their lives because they, they, weren't, they, they weren't supposed to touch it. And so you might be thinking, how in the world, if, if this is the presence of God, if this is the Ark of the Covenant, if this is the glory of God, how in the world can another nation steal it? We just saw here. 
after the Philistines captured the Ark of God. It, it was, now it's in their possession. They took it from the battleground at Ebenezer to the town of Ashdod. What I want us to do, I want us to go backwards a little bit and see here how in the world is that possible because that's going to help us uh, be able to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, but at the same time, not forfeit it. And also not to live um, in ignorance, to live thinking that just because I'm around godly people, just because I go to church, just because I read the Bible, just because I felt the presence of God at that church doesn't mean that you have aligned your ways with him. Amen. It doesn't mean, so if, if you are walking in your own ways, even though you're doing all of these ritualistic things, God is not obligated to, to give you his favor or his anointing if you're living in disobedience. And so God's anointed people, God's chosen people, the nation of Israel, they had the presence of God, the glory of God, the Ark of the Covenant st stolen from them. And I want to show you how. I'm going to try to do this as quickly as possible. But in that second chapter of, of 1 Samuel, we see here, now the sons of Eli were scoundrels who had no respect for the Lord or for their duties as priests. So Eli was the priest at the time, appointed by God to be the priest. And so people would bring their sacrifices to him and they would receive atonement or a covering for their sin. But it wasn't the lasting atonement. It, that came when Jesus came. That was a permanent. Uh, when Jesus came, it was, it was a, an everlasting, eternal uh, sacrifice that he made. So they would bring their, their sacrifices to Eli. And so Eli put his two sons in charge because he was getting old. And so, but his two sons were, I love this word. He says they were scoundrels who had no respect for the Lord for their, nor, or for their duties as priests. Skip down to verse 22. Now Eli was very old, but, but he was aware of what his sons were doing to the people of Israel. He knew, for instance, that his sons were seducing the young women who assisted at the entrance of the tabernacle. You thought that was new. This has been going on since the beginning of time. People with a title, people with a position, taking advantage of vulnerable people who were trusting them to show them and lead them to God, lead them into the presence of God. And they, what they did, they were scoundrels, the word of God says. And even their father knew that they were taking the women and seducing them when they were just trying to, to do the will of God. They were trying to work in the temple. They were trying to do what, what, what the best that they could for the kingdom of God. And he knew that his sons were doing this. He knew, for instance, let me see, uh, and then he says in 23, Eli said to them, I've been hearing reports from, from all the people about the wicked things you, you're doing. Why do you keep sinning? You must stop, my sons. The reports I hear among the Lord's people are not good. If someone sins against another person, God can mediate for the, guilt, for the guilty party. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede? You're in trouble. But Eli's sons wouldn't listen to their father, for the Lord was already planning to put them to death. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew taller and grew in favor and with the Lord and with the people. So God had made a promise that he was already planning to put Eli's sons to death because they were disgracing and bringing dishonor they were bringing perversion. They were bringing wickedness and evil and tying it, tying it in to the tabernacle, tying it in to the sacrifices that people were supposed to be making to become pure. But the two priests that were put into place were doing just the opposite. And if you read for yourself, you see where they were taking, they were, they were instructing the people to bring the sacrifices in a certain way so that they can feed on them later on and be to their own benefit. So that's why I told you earlier, if, if, if there's a prophet or someone who calls themselves a pastor or a preacher and it doesn't line up with scripture, run. Don't listen. 
don't get yourself in a situation where you become mad and, and hostile and hard with God. Because it's not God's fault. Can I hear an amen? amen. <laughs> in a way, it's our fault if we don't know the word of God and we allow the, in quotes, man of God or the woman of God to, to dissuade us or distract us from the word of God. It, it, what we have now, we have the word of God. And it's up to us to know it so that we cannot be persuaded against it or, or in, a, in a, another direction. Let me skip forward here. Let's get to the, the juicy part here. So let's go to, let's go to um, chapter 4. 1 Samuel chapter 4. At that time, Israel was at war with the Philistines. So we already know what's going down behind the scenes, underneath the surface. There's some horrible things going on. Let's go back to, to chapter 2, verse 30. I, I really need to share this with you. He says, there's a man who came to Eli, was a prophet, began to speak the word of, of the Lord to him. And this is what he said in that 30th verse, second chapter. Therefore, the Lord, the God of Israel says, I promise that, that your branch of the tribe of Levi would always be my priests. So he made a promise that they would always be my priests, but I will honor those who honor me and I will despise those who think lightly of me. That's why I take so personally this position and the title that I had. That's why for so long I didn't want it. Dad, I'll back you up. I'll do anything to make you look good. I'll do anything for the church, but I just don't want your position. I don't want anything to do with it. He said, I understand, son, because I said the same thing to my dad. And so when God put that calling on my heart and on my life, I couldn't run from it. I would rather be, I would rather it be hard and be in the will of God than to be frustrated running for the rest of my life. And so that's why I'm here today. And I'm telling you, it's an honor. It's a privilege to be able to, to present the word of truth to you. It's an honor because I'm able to see the power of God living on the inside of you, changing you from the inside out. And it's going to continue to happen as, as we continue to, to press in to what God is building, what God is doing. Chapter 4. At that time, Israel was at war with the Philistines. The Israelite army was camped near Ebenezer, and the Philistines were at Aphek. The Philistines attacked and defeated the army of Israel, killing 4,000 men. That's a lot of men. Which shows us, you might be thinking, if you just read that verse out of context, you would think, what's God doing? Is God sleeping at the will? Is God, is God on vacation? Why, why am I going through what I'm going through in my life? And I'm not saying that everything that you go through, God is, is making it happen. Because we got to realize that life does happen. And that Satan, along with God, they get blamed for a lot of things that was just life. Amen? And so even in those frustrations, we still have to lean in to the truth of God's word. Continue to trust him when we don't realize where the, what's happening or what's going on. So we see the, the Israelites are defeated by the Philistines. They lose 4,000 men. After the battle was over, the troops retreated to their camp. And the elders of Israel asked, why did the Lord allow us to be defeated by the Philistines? Then they said, let's bring the Ark of the Covenant. That'll do it. The presence of God. The glory of God. From Shiloh, let's bring the Ark of the Covenant. If we carry it into battle with us, it will save us from our enemies. So they sent men to Shiloh to bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Heaven's armies, who is enthroned between the, the, cher, uh, the cherubim. Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, were also there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. When all the Israelites saw the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord coming in the camp, their shout of joy was so loud it made the ground do what? Shake. It made the ground shake. They were so excited that the Ark of the Covenant was coming in because they knew that that would be their victory. But wait. When all the Israelites saw the Ark of the Covenant, we just read that six, what's going on, the Philistines asked. What's all the shouting about in, in, in the Hebrew camp? When they were told it was because the Ark of the Lord had arrived, they panicked. The gods have come into their camp, they cried. This is a disaster. We've never had to face anything like this before. Help. 
Who can save us from these mighty gods of Israel? Notice they begin to testify on behalf of Israel. They are the same gods who destroyed the Egyptians with plagues when Israel was in the wilderness. Fight as never before, Philistines. If you don't, we will become the Hebrew slaves just as they have become ours. Stand up like men and fight. So the Philistines fought desperately and Israel was defeated again. Israel was defeated again. Can you say that with me? Israel was defeated again. Check this out. It was even greater. 30,000 Israelite soldiers died that day. The survivors turned and fled to their tents. Number 11, the ark of God was captured in Hophni and Phinehas. The two sons of Eli were what? On different days? The same day. What did God prophesy would happen? Eli, both of your sons are going to die on the same day. I didn't read that part, but it, it. God told Eli, he says, just to let you know. Watch this. Chapter 2, verse 34. And to prove that what I've said will come true, I will cause your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, to die on the same day. Can I tell you that the word of God, when, when, we, when we say the word of God, when we want to convince someone, we, we tend to either begin our phrase or end our phrase with, I promise or I swear. Just to kind of get the, 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 the uh, idea across because we've been lied to so much, right? Over the, over our, we, 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 have, uh, we have baggage. <laughs> And so we're trying to let the person know, I'm, I'm being honest with you, I, I swear, or I promise. But let me tell you, the word of God, you never see that happen because God's word is truth. God doesn't have to say, I promise, to make it more truth. God's word is the truth. What did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth. He doesn't have the truth. He's not sharing the truth. He is the truth. And so when he speaks, you can know without a shadow of a doubt that his word will return to him. It will not return to him void. But whatever God says will come to pass. Amen. Amen. And so what we see here, we see this in, in, in motion here. And I want to end with this, this fifth chapter here. After the Philistines, well, no, let's go, let me back up here. Uh, chapter 4, verse, verse 12. A man from the tribe of Benjamin ran from the battlefield and arrived at Shiloh later that same day. He had torn his clothes and put dust on his head to show his grief. Eli was waiting beside the road to hear the news of the battle, for his heart trembled for the safety of the ark of, of God. He was, he was worried about, the pre don't be worried about the presence of God. He doesn't need your help. He doesn't need us to worship him. He doesn't need for us to acknowledge him. The need is here. He doesn't need us, but we need to worship him. We need to honor him. We need, and you, you see this all across the globe. We're being lied to to say that you need this. You need this sexual perversion. You need this, this medicine in your body. You need this. You need that. One more subscription, right? But the only thing we need is the presence of God. The only thing that we need is to lean in to what God is doing. And so he's worried about the safety of the ark of God. When the messenger arrived and told what had happened, an outcry resounded throughout the town. What is all this noise about, Eli asked. The messenger rushed over to Eli, who was 98 years old and blind. He said to Eli, I have just come from the battlefield. I was there this very day. What happened, my son, Eli demanded. He said, and this is his response, Israel has been defeated by the Philistines. The messenger replied, the people have been slaughtered. And your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were also killed. And the ark of God has been captured. When the messenger mentioned what had happened to the ark of God, Eli fell backward from his seat beside the gate. He broke his neck and died, for he was old and overweight. He had been Israel's judge for 40 years. 
Eli's daughter-in-law, the wife of Phineas, was pregnant and near the time of death or delivery. When she heard that the ark of God had been captured and that her father-in-law and husband were dead, she went into labor and gave birth. She died in childbirth, but before she passed away, the midwives tried to encourage her. Don't be afraid, they said. You have a baby boy. But she didn't answer or pay attention to them. She named the child Ichabod, which means where is the glory. Would you say that with me? Where is the glory? For she said, Israel's glory is gone. She named him this because the ark of God had been captured and because her father-in-law and husband were dead. Then she said, the glory is departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured. And the big idea that I want us to see this morning is that our outcome is not dependent on our proximity to the Spirit of God or to the glory of God. The outcome, our outcome is dependent on our obedience and following His truth, His will, His purpose, His plan. And that doesn't involve me. It doesn't involve my will or my, I, I, my, my ways are not his ways. His plans are not my plans. And so what we've got to do in this consumer age, and I feel sorry for a lot of churches who are, who are caving in to the consumer age, just, just throwing out a three nugget, nugget uh, message, throwing the lights and the smoke. And there's nothing wrong with all that stuff. But if there's no spirit, if there's no glory, if there's no presence of God, we go home the same man, the same woman that we were when we came, when we walked into the building. Can you say amen? Amen. And I'm sick and tired of watching such amazing men, such amazing women come into the church and think just because of their proximity, because they're surrounded with people who love God. And they maybe even get the the goose pimples all over their body, up and down their spine. That they think that that's the favor of God. You may have been in proximity to the Spirit of God, but are you listening? Are you following? Are you trusting and clinging to and relying on Jesus Christ as the Son of God and the Savior of your soul? Because if you're not, you're going to walk away the same person and wonder, why, God? Why have you allowed the Ark of the Covenant to be stolen by that heathen nation, the Philistines? And God is saying, what did he say? Let me just say it again. Therefore, the Lord, the God of Israel says, I promise that your branch of the tribe of Levi would always be my priests. That was my promise to you. But I will honor those who honor me, and I will despise those who think lightly of me. Kingdom work is no joke. The enemy, the devil, the world, your pride will make you think that it's all about a temporary fix or a temporary feeling. If I can just get this, if I can just get to the next next wrong, then I'll make it. You get to the next rung, and now your frustrations are bigger because you have more responsibility. You have more duties. You thought getting married was going to fix all your problems. But now, not only do you have your own problems, but now you have the problems of another person. You just multiplied your problems. You thought that what would fix the marriage if, if I could just have children. These beautiful kids will come into this family and will fix everything. Now you have a, a screaming baby who, you, 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 you get what I'm saying. We have to get over the thought that it's about proximity because I went to church, because I read a verse, because I read that Insta quote that was, oh, so holy. Or I, I, I posted something or I talked to someone and said something nice to somebody. God says, 
that I will honor those who honor me. And I will despise those who think lightly of me. You see, it's not about you. It's not about me. But it's about Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. And that the pray, our prayer should be, and our, our seek, when we seek the face of the Lord, our, our prayer should be, Lord, what role do you want me to play in your kingdom? What do you want me to do? Because in this consumer age, it's turned around. God, you're going to do this for me? God, if you don't do this for me, I'm, I'm turning my back on you. Like he needs you. But if we can flip the script and say, no, devil, you're a liar. No, world, you don't have my best interest. Even close to your radar. It's like, like Eli's two sons. They were, they were convincing the people to do what they wanted to do so that they can get the glory, so that they can get the recognition. But for us as Jesus followers, we've got to be led by the word of God and by the spirit of God. One final scripture, John 7. I want to show you what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. John 7, 37. On the last day, the climax of the festival, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds. He said, anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. When he said living water, he was speaking of the Spirit, the glory of God, the presence of God, the third person in the Trinity. He said he was speaking of the Spirit who would be given to everyone. Someone say everyone. Everyone believing in him. But the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet entered into his glory. We know in the book of Acts, we see that Jesus ascended into heaven and the Holy Spirit came down. And from that day forward, the church has been alive and well. The church is not decreasing, it's increasing. The church is not dying, it's flourishing. <laughs> Whatever Jesus is building is growing. It's not moving backwards, it's moving forward. It's not decreasing, but it's making progress. Can you say amen? amen? What I want you to do is I want you to stand to your feet. I want you to raise your hands to Jesus this morning, thanking him for who he is. If you have not yet been filled with the Holy Spirit and you're a believer in Jesus Christ, would you begin to seek the Holy Spirit? Allow him to come on the inside of you to speak into your heart, to be your leader, to be your guide, to be your director. Just let him have free will in your life, within your heart, starting right now. We thank you, Heavenly Father.